Uh, we'll count down. As I said, don't plan to stop at 29 seconds. Plan to go all the way to T0. We'll get down to core stage engine start inside of six seconds, six six ish seconds, uh, booster ignition and lift off. And uh, at that point in time, I'll hand off to the uh, ascent flight director, just like I'm going to do today when I hand off to my <laughs> colleague here as part of the briefing, Mr. Uh, Jeff Radigan. Thanks, Charlie. It's a great day to be here talking to you all. Uh, you know. Over mission control, of course, we're doing our final simulations, getting ready. The crew has uh, undergone all of uh, their final training and uh, is, is wrapping things up. Uh, you can see in the video here that, uh, as Charlie mentioned, uh, we get lift off, and then the core stage uh, is, and boosters are going to take us to orbit. And uh, it's, it's going to be a, a monumental day. We're, we're really looking forward to it. Let's see. So I will talk through a little bit of uh, just an overview of the mission. Of course, we'll get uh, the boosters uh, jettisoning there. A couple minutes into launch, and then the core stage will uh, boost uh, the upper stage, ICPS, and the Orion spacecraft into orbit. Uh, at that point, uh, we'll actually uh, separate from the core stage and uh, then go ahead and deploy the Orion solar arrays, setting ourselves up uh, into a low Earth orbit to start. We'll spend a couple hours in low Earth orbit. And then the, uh, the upper stage will do the Apogee rays burn that will take us uh, into a higher Earth orbit where we'll spend about 24 hours checking out the Orion systems, life support systems, crew systems, uh, ensuring everything's ready. Uh, along the way, we're going to do a, a ProxOps demo. And uh, see, once I think once this video uh, completes, we'll cue the, uh, the ProxOps demo video. And uh, the crew's going to get a chance to fly the Orion spacecraft for the first time around the upper stage. And uh, that's going to be great for us. I mentioned the, the crew readiness, uh, you know, they're undergone all of their training and, uh, you know, I, I read Victor, Jeremy and Christina, they're all ready to, to get on the rocket and, uh, and, and get on with the mission. Um, you know, it's one of the interesting things. I, I don't think they can get enough training. Uh, you know, you always want more to the point where we're actually installing, I think their, uh, their cockpit in quarantine. So they'll be able to do some last minute training, but, uh, you know, from my perspective, they're ready to go. Here you can see a video of uh, the ProxOps demo of what we're going to do. We're actually going to separate. We're going to turn Orion around. And then uh, the crew is going to pilot the spacecraft around the upper stage, the ICPS. This is what uh, is going to give us data to ensure that we can dock on future flights. We're all looking forward to being able to dock uh, with a Starship in the future or uh, a, a, a blue uh, lander. And uh, on Artemis 2, we're going to ensure that all of our models, all of our systems work successfully to be able to do those future dockings uh, as we're in that higher Earth orbit and doing a checkout. Let's see, after we get uh, into that higher Earth orbit and we do the, the checkout, of course, we'll consult with uh, Mr. Honeycutt and the mission management team, make sure all systems are go for, uh, for the translunar injection burn, and we'll take the crew to the moon. So let's see if we can uh, cue the next video, please. It takes three days to get to the moon, and uh, you know the crew along the way is going to be doing uh, some additional, more detailed checkouts of the spacecraft. We'll ensure that we've got a, a good, healthy spacecraft before we leave Earth. But then, of course, this is a test flight. We want to put Orion through its paces. And then as we fly by the, uh, the far side of the moon here, the crew is going to spend a day in lunar observation. So they're going to you know, basically spend uh, the day giving their observations on the far side of the moon, which uh, hasn't been seen, you know, parts of it hasn't been seen by human eyes before. So that'll be a great opportunity. And of course, they're going to take a, a fair amount of video and, uh, you know, just have those observations. Uh, I will I will caution you that they're a long way from Earth and signals are uh, a little weak at that point. So we will get some video down, but uh, the real the real high definition video will be post-flight when they come back. Finally, they're going to you know head on back home here and get ready for entry. Um, it, it's uh, it's a long mission, uh, you know, three days there, a day around the moon, and three days back. Uh, all of that to say that we have to set them up for entry successfully, right? Our our you know one job, as as Mr. Honeycutt said, is to bring the crew home safely. We need to hit the right entry interface corridor and bring them home. And uh, once we do that. Then uh, the Orion will uh, split into two. We'll have the, the CMA and the service module come off the crew module, uh, which will then uh, come through reentry. And, uh, you know, we've got a, a whole series of parachutes uh, that uh, slow down. We're, we're going much faster coming from the moon than we are in low Earth orbit. 
And so we need to slow down a little bit more and it takes more parachutes to do that. Um, and so here we've got a video of uh, what the re-entry sequence looks like. Of course, the crew is protected by the heat shield and uh, we'll go through a blackout period where we can't talk to them and then come out the other side uh, underneath the parachutes. Let's see, I do wanna mention this, this is a test flight and uh, there's things that uh, are gonna be unexpected. You know, I think we've prepared for those as much as we can and we're very much uh, looking forward to uh, flying this mission successfully with the crew and learning what we need to on Artemis II uh, moving forward and, uh, and paving the road for future Artemis missions. Let's see, uh, next I'll hand it over. Once, uh, once the video here completes and the, uh, the crew gets down safely, of course we hand things over to Lily and uh, her recovery team to go pick them up. Thank you, Jeff. If you can't tell, I'm just a little tiny bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to really talk to you about recovery, and uh, I represent such a wonderful team, so bear with me. Uh, my name is Lily, and I'm the NASA Artemis Land Air Recovery Director. I'm going to walk you through the process of how we will safely recover the Artemis II crew and the Orion spacecraft once they return from their trip around the moon. Uh, within 24 hours of splashdown, we will be positioned in the Pacific Ocean within miles of the targeted recovery site, which is normally off the coast of San Diego. Uh, the recovery ship will approach the landing zone and a team of Navy divers and in small boats will deploy from the ship into the open water. Prior to splashdown, a team from Johnson Space Center will map where the elements are jettisoned from Orion, such as the forward bay cover, the drogue parachutes, and the mortars. And this is to make sure that our boats and helicopters supporting recovery stay clear of all this debris. Uh, the divers will be the first to approach Orion, and they will conduct assessments of the air and water surrounding the capsule to make sure that it's safe to approach and help the crew exit Orion. After ensuring the area is safe, they'll open the Orion hatch and help the astronauts from their seats to a large inflatable raft called the front porch. Uh, once all the four helicopters, uh, sorry, once all the four astronauts are on the front porch, we will tow the capsule away from the front porch and the team will wait, uh, pick up from the Navy helicopters which are deployed from the recovery vessel. Uh, two helicopters are going to rotate, picking up all the four crew members before they return to the recovery ship uh, within a few minutes of each other. Uh, once the crew has exited the helicopters, they're going to proceed straight to the ship's medical bay to undergo uh, routine post-medical uh, checkups. We expect to recover the crew and deliver them to the med bay within two hours of splashdown. Uh, with the crew safely out of the capsule and um, in tandem, we're going to be recovering the, ca uh, the capsule. Uh, teams are going to work on towing the Orion into the well deck of the ship, pretty much uh, similar to how we did that during Artemis 1. Uh, the Navy divers will ensure that a system of lines uh, are connected to the capsule uh, to ensure that we can help tow the Orion vehicle onto the ship. When Orion is close to the ship, an additional line is going to be attached to uh, a pneumatic winch that's inside the ship, and that's how we're going to pull the vehicle into the capsule. Uh, once Orion is safely inside the, the ship, we will start making our return uh, back to Naval Base San Diego. Depending on our distance or when we land, uh, the Artemis troop crew will either fly off the ship um, back to shore or they will ride uh, with the recovery vessel back to San Diego. Uh, once we arrive uh, back to shore, the astronauts are going to depart to go to Houston while the NASA recovery team will complete some post-splashdown uh, processing activities of Orion before we transport it back to Kennedy Space Center. Mm -hmm. um, some of those tasks that we're going to do is uh, uh, perform all the initial assessment of the capsule. We'll remove some science payloads that need to be expedited and return back to uh, their original NASA center, um, and then we'll be ready to transport it back. I do want to take a moment to say that um, we want to thank our partners uh, from the U.S. military who are supporting our Artemis recovery operations. Without them, we really could not have done that. And they have been there with us since the early days of human spaceflight. Um, our joint NASA, Navy, and Air Force team, we've been training for several years together to ensure we have a seamless recovery of Orion and the Artemis II crew. 
We had a very successful recovery of uh, the Orion spacecraft during Artemis 1, and we feel confident that through our testing and training, along with the Navy and the other collaborations that uh, support us, we will make Artemis 2 just as successful. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, and thanks, Lily. And I just wanted to sing a song that makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck or on your arms. Um, I'll confess I played that song this morning um, because this is a very historic moment, um, an exciting moment. We're rolling out the integrated SLS in Orion for a flight that will carry four of our friends, um, our NASA family members, around the moon and bring them safely back to Earth. Artemis II is a test flight. It truly is exploration. There will be a number of firsts um, that we'll be proving out on this flight. And I like to say that during exploration, science is our toolbox for survival. With that in mind, I'm excited to present to you our Artemis II integrated research campaign, uh, which involves activities across biology, human research, space weather research, uh, and also some planetary geology. Our integrated campaign is designed to help unlock more time for science on future missions by minimizing crew time spent on other activities uh, and increasing crew and support team efficiency on the science tasks themselves, all while learning how to best thrive in the deep space environment. During this flight, we will learn how the spacecraft behaves. Through our research campaign, we will also learn how we, human beings, behave in that same environment. The combination of these two things will help us optimize our time in future missions. We'll be flying a payload called AVATAR, which stands for a Virtual Astronaut Tissue Analog Response. Basically, AVATAR enables us to mimic individual astronaut organs. And Artemis II will mark the first time that these types of devices have been tested outside the Van Allen belts or away from the ISS. We will test if we can use these astronaut avatars as tools uh, for measuring and predicting our human response to the deep space stressors. To evaluate this, scientists will compare avatar data with space station findings we've already collected, as well as with samples taken from our crew both before and after the flight. For NASA, Avatar could help inform measures um, to ensure crew health on future deep space missions, including personalizing medical kits uh, for each astronaut. For citizens here on Earth, it could lead to adv advancements in individualized treatments for diseases such as cancer. We'll also be flying uh, an activity called Archer, Artemis Research for Crew Health and Readiness. For the Archer study, crew members will wear movement and sleep monitors uh, called actigraphy devices uh, before, during, and after the mission. These wristband monitors will enable us to study real-time health and behavioral information for the crew members and help scientists study how crew members' sleep and activity patterns are affected um, and how overall health and performance is affected. The study will evaluate how our crew members perform individually as a team throughout the mission, including how easily they can move around within the confined space of their capsule. We'll also measure a set of immune biomarkers. For the immune biomarker study, crew members will supply saliva samples through the flight, um, and they have done so on Earth and will do so when they return for comparison. Scientists will gain insights into how the astronauts' immune systems are affected by the increased stressors of the radiation environment, isolation, and distance away from Earth during deep space flights. We'll also extend a set of ISS activities to the moon called Space Flight Standard Measures. Astronauts will collect a set of measurements spanning multiple physiological systems to provide a comprehensive snapshot of how space flight affects the human uh, body. We will conduct also physiological assessments, including testing their head, eye, and body movements uh, before, during, and after the space flight, and that will be compared with blood samples that are taken before and after the flight as well. As soon as possible after landing, the crew members participate in basically an obstacle course to see how quickly they can function soon after going through a gravity transition. 
A few days later, they'll conduct a simulated spacewalk and will do various tasks in a pressurized uh, spacesuit again to investigate how quickly, again, they can adapt to that train, uh, that change in gravity. That prepares us for landing on the moon and eventually down the road going to destinations such as Mars. During the flight, we will make measurements with a suite of radiation sensors. You may remember that we have did something similar during Artemis 1. Crew members will keep detectors in their pockets of their suits so that we can measure their individual exposure uh, in real time during the flight. Two other sets of sensors will also be placed in Orion. One will monitor radiation at different shielding locations in the spacecraft so that we can gain a better understanding of what the radiation uh, protection uh, does for our crew members on board. Uh, we will also be partnering with the Germany Aerospace Agency, or DLR, to provide sensors similar to what they provided during Artemis 1. And we, the crew will deploy these around the Orion, again, to give us a comprehensive view of that radiation environment. Last but not least, a very exciting aspect to it is uh, the ability to observe the moon. Uh, so you've heard about, a little bit about that already. Um, and if we could cue up our first image here. Our crew will take time to observe the moon as they pass around the far side of the moon. Far side is the side of the moon that we never see from here on Earth. The moon will look about like holding a basketball at arm's length to them uh, from the Orion. Um, and if we could cue up the second image as well now just to give another look here. Depending on when the mission launches and the final flight path, it's possible they'll see parts of the moon that they that have never been viewed by human eyes. All of the Apollo missions launched uh, for the landing to occur in the early lunar morning. A lunar day includes 14 days of sunlight, 14 days of darkness. Uh, so basically, the crew that were flying around the moon all saw the same lighting conditions. So this could be a very unique opportunity to see the moon. We'll be asking them to look for things like albedo differences, variations in uh, the grayscale that human eyes really can detect. Uh, in addition to their observations, which they'll be communicating back to the Earth, our science support teams will conduct their own test flight of a sort here on the ground, uh, testing out how our support teams work uh, to make sure that we can best support them when they actually go land on the moon during Artemis three and beyond. One last piece to our Artemis II science activities includes the deployment of four international CubeSats. Uh, could we go ahead and queue up that image? Artemis II mission has provided us with the opportunity to deploy four CubeSats. Uh, those are basically shoebox-sized uh, payloads that essentially act as their own spacecraft once we deploy them. Uh, our partners in Argentina, Germany, Korea, and Saudi Arabia are all partnering with NASA to take advantage of the opportunity that we have with Artemis to fly uh, their own CubeSats. Each has its own objectives, but in general, all of the CubeSats are conducting complementary space weather measurements to the types of research that NASA is doing. So we're excited to provide this opportunity to our partners as we lead the way in uh, space exploration and ex exploration of the moon. So real quick to conclude here, our integrated research campaign for Artemis II builds upon what we learned in Artemis I, and it sets the stage for successful exploration of the moon and ultimately onto Mars. Our campaign will help us understand the space weather that we'll face during future lunar missions, uh, how to observe the moon and communicate with the support teams here on Earth, and in general, how we will react to, survive, and thrive in that deep space environment. Therefore, I like to say that Artemis II science is the science of us. Artemis II science is the science of humankind and how we'll act as we continue to press the boundaries and explore in deep space. Thank you very much. Back to you, Rachel. All right. We'll go ahead and take questions. Uh, for the